Okay, perfect. All right, so I think I have uh, I have control and uh, ready to go, so I can get started on uh, on the webinar here. Perfect. And my apologies for my my voice. It's a good thing we weren't doing this a, a couple days ago. I, I actually sound uh, probably a lot worse than uh, than I feel. But anyway, we'll get started here with uh, with this case study that uh, that we are working on, accelerating full waveform inversion via OpenCL on AMD GPUs. And as Dee Dee mentioned, my name is Chris Mason and I'm a product manager here at Acceler and looking forward to telling you about this project that we worked on and uh, some of the outcomes and, uh, and successes. A little bit of background about Acceler. Uh, some of you may know what we do or have heard of us uh, in the past. We're, we're in the high performance computing space. Um, we have, have a focus towards oil and gas, although we do HPC uh, uh, development outside of that. Uh, we have products that we uh, we ship in the seismic space and uh, as well as uh, the electromagnetic space. We also provide uh, training. So if you're interested in learning about uh, OpenCL and, and how to program the GPU, we provide training and consulting. Uh, consulting. Uh, my apologies, something just popped up there. Let's bring that back. Um, OpenCL, uh, we do some OpenCL training for AMG, AMD GPUs, and what we're trying to do there is uh, is is help you get started with with programming the GPU, uh, help you find some of the uh, uh, or help you understand the architecture of the GPU so that you're not um, it basically eases you into the programming model. We get to share with you our development experience that we've had through all of our projects and products, things that work, things that don't work. It's a, it's a really nice format because we provide lectures and hands-on lab exercises and uh, we, we deliver them worldwide. Uh, we also do consulting <clears throat> and this can range from anything where we take a quick look at a piece of code that you've written through uh, a, a much larger scale uh, porting and optimization and bringing code to market and we'll talk about how we did that uh, in, in this project. So what we're uh, what we're going to talk about in in this uh, in this webinar is is full waveform inversion. The project that we worked on uh, at that point, we're going to after I introduce the project and, and a little bit of background about full waveform inversion. Welcome to GoToWebinar. Webinars made easy. We'll then talk about some of the optimizations that we used uh, to make this uh, to make to address the challenge. Um, of the long runtime that this particular algorithm uh, it takes to takes to run. So we'll talk about the optimizations that we did to uh, to improve the performance, and then we'll present the performance results and and uh, and show some nice uh, nice performance gains on the AMD GPU. So for the next three slides, I'm going to talk about full waveform inversion, and I'll I'll provide a little bit of a caveat saying that. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer, so what I've done for these next few slides is I've, uh, I've sat in with my uh, geology and geophysics uh, folks here in the office and, uh, and tried to get a quick crash course on, on full waveform inversion. So uh, if you start asking me detailed questions here, <clears throat> I'm not sure that uh, I would rely on my personal expertise to decide where to drill it well. Anyway, full waveform inversion, it's a seismic inversion technique, meaning we've, we've taken some sources, um, we've emitted some signals, some seismic signals, we've received them, and we're trying to estimate or build a model uh, from that data to predict what does the geology look like, um, and ultimately, where, where, would the, uh, where would the hydrocarbons that we're searching for uh, be located. From the software perspective, we use a finite difference solution to an acoustic wave equation to propagate the signals through the model. One particular aspect about full waveform inversion is that it is extraordinarily computationally expensive. It takes a long time to run a model and we'll see how that kind of works as we go through a little bit more of the details on the model. So here's a picture of, of what sort of happening as we iterate through the, through the process. So in the first diagram here in the upper left, we have a very simple velocity model of the Earth. In fact, it doesn't look particularly exciting at all. It's just a bunch of flat uh, layers stacked upon one another. What we're going to do is, well, in practice, of course, the, the Earth doesn't necessarily always look like that, especially in some more interesting geologies. So as the signals propagate, we're going to use the signals to determine, well, what's actually happening 
in your can we use the information to get a better model? So in the second picture, you can start to see that we've developed some ridges. Um, so it's no longer just flat, um, which is again giving us a better model. And then we keep repeating the process and using the results to generate a better and better image of what's actually going on in theory to a to a very accurate uh, velocity model. So so I'll kind of be referring to this slide uh, a little bit, so this pictorial stuff, as I kind of talk about how the how the FWI algorithm actually works. So at the top, we start with a very basic initial estimate of the model. We're going to take our source and we're going to propagate it through our initial model, so through our very basic model, in this case the flat layers that we've picked here. That's going to bounce back to our receivers and we're going to compare our receivers to the data that we actually receive effectively subtract them to get the residuals. And, and this is a measure of obviously the error of, of our model versus what's actually happening or what was actually recorded. You then take your uh, residual signals and you back propagate them backwards in time through your model and that generates something called a gradient. Now a gradient is, is a series of basically plus or minus values. Do I need to raise or lower the geology? Uh, we're not the jelly, sorry, the layer levels to get to get a better better model. Now the thing about the gradient, however, is the gradient doesn't necessarily capture um, the the actual magnitude. It's sort of a relative magnitude. So this blue box here, which shows the forward propagations to generate the step length, is actually going to be responsible for scaling that. So once we've done that, once we've we've got the residuals, the gradient, and then kind of the scale factor, we then go down to update the model. So we go back to here and we said, okay, well actually here there's this ridge. So we actually needed to increase the height of that layer. So that's what's happening at, at that point. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we loop until convergence. Um, so what we're going to be doing is we loop repeatedly through this process until the residual gets to a small enough error that we're happy with, with the model. And at that point we're going to increase the frequency. And one other comment here, I also put loop over shots. So we actually loop over the shots multiple times. We propagate and back propagate repeatedly to get, uh, to get all of our residuals and gradient information. Then scale, update the model, and then repeat the outer loop again until we've reached, uh, like I say, an error where we're happy with the residual or the residual is small enough that we can increase the frequency. So why do we want to increase the frequency? Well, that increases the resolution of the model. So as we get, because we want to get more and more fine detail, so you want to have a, a, a smaller wavelength. Now, as you can imagine, increasing the frequency also has, uh, at least from a computational perspective, the negative uh, uh, property that it ends up increasing things um, uh, by, by a scale factor of four, or, or, or I guess to the fourth power is what I'm trying to say, because the the modeling of the acoustic wave has to get smaller in size, so the, the cells X, Y, and, and Z have to shrink in size, on top of the fact that the, the frequency is also, um, also increasing, so it's actually a, a fourth power increase in computational uh, um, intensity. So an extraordinarily intense uh, algorithm, a very, very time-consuming uh, issue or, uh, to resolve, so what ends up happening typically is to actually do this in practice, you would have a cluster of, of tens or even hundreds of CPU nodes to handle all, all of this data. It's going to take many days of, of, of runtime. This isn't something that runs in, in 15 minutes or an hour. And what ends up happening is to, to keep it practical, we reduce the accuracy and, qu accuracy and quality to, uh, to keep the runtime acceptable. So perhaps in this case here, our convergence criteria is, is a little less, or maybe we don't loop over as many frequencies, and that's just to, to contain the amount of time that we need to run. Um, one thing we're, we're often asked is, why not just start at a very high frequency? Well, it, it turns out it doesn't converge unless you start at a low frequency to begin with, so you do kind of have to step through with your, your model, um, the very basic model to get something good, and then further refine that with a higher frequency. So into the, into the computer engineering aspects of it and, and the GPU. So what were we doing? Well, Geotomo approached us um, to, to take on this project. 
They de develop high-end uh, geophysical software products to help uh, geophysicists around the world uh, image, uh, image beneath the subsurface. They had already had an existing uh, cluster-ready uh, multi-threaded CPI FWI solution, but they wanted it to run faster so they could deliver results quicker to their clients. So they, they looked or they, 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 they saw GPUs as a potential uh, for, for a, a way that we could uh, uh, accelerate the FWI and, uh, and they approached us and said, how can we work together to make this happen? So kind of taking a step back, why GPUs in general? And uh, it's really uh, because performance uh, is, is one of the major reasons that we, we look to them. So the first line here talks about the memory bandwidth for, for a conventional CPU, AMD CPU, versus uh, two GPUs that, uh, that AMD offers. And one thing you'll notice right away is that the memory bandwidth is significantly higher on the two, uh, the two GPUs than the CPU. And, and this is where a lot of the GPU performance is going to come from. Uh, in scientific computing, a lot, not all, but a lot of algorithms are going to be memory bandwidth limited. What that means is it's limited by you have a lot of data. How fast can you bring the data to the chip, process it, and then put it back in memory? And this is where the GPUs often offer an advantage over the CPUs. Um, but on top of that, if your algorithm also is computationally limited, you can see here that the multipliers for single and double precision are substantially higher on the GPU versus the CPU as well. The one drawback of the GPU that the CPU uh, gets to circumvent is the amount of memory. So there is a fixed uh, amount of memory, in this case for the, for the W9000 and S10000, it's limited to 6 gigabytes uh, on, on the cards. You can't increase that memory on the cards because it's physically soldered, if you will, or the memory is, like, is, 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 is physically attached to the, to the GPU. So, Whereas the CPU, it's uh, a lot more uh, flexible in the sense that you can just add uh, memory DIMMs to the system and, uh, and grow the memory in the system that way. The equivalent for the GPU is to uh, use a multi-GPU system or a cluster of GPUs, and that's what we did in this project, and we'll actually, uh, we'll actually talk about that because, as you can imagine, with seismic data, large volumes of data that need to be processed. Power consumption. Uh, the power consumption numbers, the GPU is definitely higher. However, when you compare that on a gigaflops per watt, it's actually substantially better than the CPU. And we've actually had cases in the past where customers cannot actually get more power to a physical location. The GPU is an excellent alternative because that way, you, per, per computation, the GPU does uh, substantially better than, uh, than, than the CPU. So, a lot of people are replacing some of their large CPU clusters uh, with GPU clusters just on a power consideration alone. But the one thing to take away from this slide is really the top line, the memory bandwidth um, is, is kind of the key thing that we're going to be taking advantage of in this project and in GPU computing in general. So before we kind of get into the, the, out, the, the optimizations that we did on, on that FWI algorithm, we're going to take a step back and, and talk a little bit about OpenCL, a little bit of an introduction to OpenCL at a high level. Um, just to give you a, a baseline for some of the things that we have to consider uh, when we're programming. So it's OpenCL is a parallel computing architecture standardized by, by the Kronos Group. It's a, it's a free royalty standard. Uh, they're currently, I believe, at version 2 right now. Um, it provides basically an API to coordinate parallel computation across different types of processors, whether it's a CPU or a GPU. And this is of interest in certain cases, especially scientific uh, uh, engineering computations, because certain data parallel workloads perform extremely well on the GPU. Uh, this isn't to say your internet browser or necessarily like a, a word processor would do, would do well on the GPU, uh, other than the graphics, of course. But, um, but part of the reason that, uh, that, uh, that this is a, is a popular thing is because it can accelerate uh, very data-intensive problems. Uh, OpenCL is cross-platform, so it works for both CPU and GPUs, although the caution there is something that's written for a GPU architecture, although it may compile and run on the CPU, may not be optimized and vice versa. It runs, OpenCL runs on anything from, uh, from a handheld device uh, straight up through a supercomputer. The heterogeneous model includes uh, provisions for what's called the host, which is really just 
the main computer or, or the CPU uh, in, in most cases, and then the device, which is typically a GPU or, or some other um, piece of hardware that you program with OpenCL. The way that uh, the way that you program it, and what this diagram is showing on on the right here is you've got a you've got a single threaded uh, host application that's going to launch the data parallel portions of the algorithm on the device as a kernel, and the kernel is what is going to execute on the GPU or on the device itself. How do you write a kernel? It looks pretty much like standard C uh, C functions. There's a few restrictions. Um, and many, uh, many work items are going to execute that kernel in parallel. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you launch the kernel, you're going to be launching it with hundreds and actually in practice probably thousands or tens of thousands of threads to work on a large, uh, large subset of data. While the device is working, the host is going to continue executing with its, with its single thread. Or of course it could be multi-threaded, but the but the single thread that's driving the GPU, and it's going to execute some serial code potentially between that. Now what this diagram is also showing is it's showing that two different kernels launched um, in this n-dimensional range here. In this case, we've launched a kernel with uh, that, that ends up being three by two uh, in, in dimensionality for work groups. You could launch the same kernel later with a dimensionality of two by three, and, that, and that's fine. So the host is responsible for launching, uh, launching or, or starting the code to run on the GPU. It's also responsible for memory management, data exchange to and from the device, and, and error handling as well. In terms of the memory model, and this is important for, for this project and optimizing for the GPU in, in general, you really need to understand the resources that you have available to you. There's four main types of memory on the GPU. There's global, local, constant, and private. And what the global memory refers to is, is the big, I'll call it the big blob of memory on the GPU, the six gigabytes. That's really what the global memory is referring to. Local, constant, and private memory are actually on the, now I'll have to say, I'll have to caveat that and say usually on the GPU. Uh, most of the time, let's say 90% of the time, they're physically located on the GPU device themselves. And the interesting thing about that is because they're on the device, they're extraordinarily fast, um, several orders of magnitude faster than global memory, again, which is already much faster than CPU memory. But part of the, call it the game, if you will, of, of optimizing for the GPU is to get or to use those on-chip resources as much as possible because that's going to speed up your algorithm significantly. So um, local memory refers to, to locally shared memory. Uh, that, that's on chip. Constant memory is this constant cache typically that's located on the chip and private memory typically returns, typically refers to uh, registers that are that are again located on the GPU itself. So the host and the device have separate memory spaces and the data is typically moved between them by you as, as a programmer. It's transferred over the PCI bus, um, tends to be slower when you transfer it over the PCI bus. So again, a good thought to have is migrate the data to the GPU, execute the data on the GPU, and then bring the data back. But do as much work as you can uh, without doing a lot of transfers uh, back and forth. The functions, uh, there, there are several C functions that uh, are responsible on the host. You would write them on the host side that uh, you would use to uh, create and manage the memory, basically. So you create a buffer or an array, read it, write it, that would um, that sends it uh, to and from, and then and then uh, release the uh, kind of like a free release the memory uh, there. So in this diagram or in this slide here, we have we actually have the um, sorry the kernel that we're going to uh, that we're going to work work on. In this case here, we're doing a very simple vector addition, just adding up the elements uh, eight elements here, elements zero through seven. Um, the elements come in A and B and are stored in C. The kernel you can see is actually very simple. You take in a, an input pointer A and B, and it's going to store in C. The first thing you have to do very typically at the start of your kernels is get what's called the global ID. What this is going to return is each work item is going to have a unique index that it's going to work on. So when you call this, it's going to be different for every work item. So if I am work item 3, 
this would return three. So I would know that I need to work in this element right here. So as work item three, I am responsible for adding element A3, B3, and storing it in C3. What you don't see in this kernel is a for loop. There's no need for the for loop anymore because this kernel would have been launched with eight work items to be executed in parallel. So it, it's, it looks like it's, it's like only one addition is actually occurring, but in practice, it's going to occur on, on the number of work items that you launch the kernel with. <coughs> From the host code, what you'll be doing is you'll be allocating n bytes, size of a float, for example, in this case, storing it in, in device memory AB, A, A, AD, ABD, and CD. You'll send that information to the device, launch the kernel with the ng range kernel command, and then you'll read the data back from the device into the host, and then we'll have our, our answer. So that's what the host code looks like. Sorry, that's what the kernel code looks like. Now let's talk about the, the, the FWI project specifically and how we, uh, how we approach uh, uh, projects like that. So, and, and how you should think about approaching your projects as well, at least as a starting point anyway, obviously you'll customize things you need. Profiling, it's, it's absolutely critical to understand um, where the time is being spent uh, in, in a piece of code. It, it sounds fairly straightforward. It, it is fairly straightforward, but it's, it's sometimes overlooked. As programmers, we can get uh, our, um, in a mindset of like oh, all the time is being spent here, and, and if I speed that up, I'm really going to improve the performance of the algorithm, and that's not necessarily the case. However, in this case, it, it, it was. Um, we were able to isolate it or identify an area that, uh, that, that was, it was a key bottleneck. So we got the code, got reference data sets and reference benchmarks. So Reference benchmarks, ideally, you know, interested in kind of some small ones to test, but obviously more practical ones that where where um, where people are seeing the long run times. Set up some local machines to try to uh, mimic what uh, what Geotomo had on their site, so we can confirm their reference benchmark. It's again amazing how only small or subtle changes in the in the hardware setup can really affect or impact the. Uh, the runtime and the distribution of time. It's a very sensitive variable. So determine what the target uh, deployment platform was, set one up internally and, and confirm the numbers, and then, and then we go through the code manually and add timers to determine um, where the time is actually being spent um, and, and where the areas of interest are in terms of uh, speeding it up. At this point, we typically do a feasibility analysis, and we did this with Geotomo. It's a, it's a short five-day kind of analysis or, or a couple days depending on the scope. The idea being, okay, well, what's, what's going to be the gains? How long is this whole project going to take? You know, at that point, we can make a call. Both, both, uh, both, uh, both people can make a call and say, yeah, maybe it's worth proceeding with this project, or maybe it isn't, depending on, on what the... Uh, the time distributions and potential gains are going to look like. So with an FWI job, we also have to consider the fact that the GPU memory is limited to, to six gigabytes per card. So um, yeah, fortunately, Geotomo is a way that they can kind of restrict the, the size of one shot to fit in, in, that, uh, in that window and then run multiple shots on, on multiple GPUs. So, but as designers as well, we have to be cognizant and, and uh, frugal with our memory allocations and things like that. So. At that point, we determined where um, the time was being spent, and uh, and it worked out well. There was a large percentage of time being spent in the uh, in the computational intensive areas. So it showed uh, Omdahl's law, as in basically saying your your maximum speed up is going to be limited by the amount that you can uh, uh, parallelize um, the uh, the region that you're looking at. The rest of the serial code is going to uh, eventually you know, start to dominate. But again, there was a lot of time was being spent in the computation, so that worked out well. And then some other uh, some other things we have to look at too, like is there anything that uh, may or may not behave well on the on the GPU? Um, are we going to have to do domain decomposition of, of of these domains across multiple GPUs, or can we restrict it to one GPU? Um, and we kind of agree on on those. And then we can get into the, the interesting parts of the implementation. So we start by creating a test harness. Obviously, it's important to determine the inputs match the outputs, especially with the GPU. Um, debugging is a little more challenging on the GPU, so it's important to, to create a good test harness. 
we start by implementing simple kernels just to make sure that they work, match our tests, and then we're going to, to iterate and start to optimize on that point. Um, there's some hardware driver issues that we actually ran into in this, uh, in this project that we had to, to resolve. And then we had to enable multi-GPU device support. So with that, what we mean there is, we, again, you have hundreds or thousands of shots. You want to have them run in parallel. So fortunately, we were able to do this um, in, in one shot per GPU. We didn't actually, we were able to, to, to fit one shot on a GPU uh, on one uh, six gigabyte GPU, which meant that you could run multiple shots in parallel across multiple GPUs. After we we did that, it was uh, time to do some optimization um, and uh, and improve performance. And we'll, and we'll talk about the optimization steps in detail. <coughs> Excuse me. And for wrap up, obviously we delivered the the results and the code back to Geotomo, provided them with the documentation, and then we trained um, the developers on OpenCL so they're able to maintain it going forward. So the key optimizations, and, and this is something that, uh, again, kind of carries over into other algorithms and, and important details as well. So coalescing, and this is an extremely important, uh, important aspect of GPU programming. You really want to make sure your memory accesses patterns um, in, in the GPU in, in the best possible way to, to maximize the memory bandwidth. So what that means is when you're accessing global memory, you typically want to request a multi-byte word. So for example, like a float four data type. So four floats coming in in one, uh, one packet. Um, the idea would be that reduces the number of requests to the GPU um, whenever possible. And fewer requests means less contention. It means you're maximizing your memory bandwidth. Um, and the other thing too is you always want to access memory continuously. So ideally, work item zero accesses element zero, work item one accesses element one, because that allows for large uh, contiguous blocks to be uh, extracted across the memory bus. In doing so, that maximizes the throughput. And this was critical in this, uh, in this uh, application. You say, well, Chris, that's probably pretty trivial to do. Um, it turns out that a lot of algorithms have um, strange indexing patterns or um, sometimes you might have uh, um, a structure that has array, uh, like an array of structures which again might uh, scatter or stride your accesses through memory. And so a lot of the challenge in doing GPU programming is, um, is reworking or reformatting the way that you're, you're accessing the memory to, to maximize and then really take advantage of that, uh, of that uh, hardware. Uh, the next thing that we needed to, to look at was uh, an iterative kernels for stencil operations. So this is the propagation part, and um, the way it works is that the, the output in this, this red box is, is, is a weighted input of its, its surrounding neighbors in the x, y, and z direction. The off-axis uh, weights are zero, so, so um, only the, only the on-axis weights have uh, non-zero values. And this is to propagate the, uh, to propagate the wave. <coughs> The basic implementation would have each item, so as, as item, if I'm, I'm the work item that's operating on, on the red element here, the naive implementation would have me as a work item to read in all of these different, um, different off, uh, or sorry, all of these different um, neighbors um, in, in the same work item. But the issue is you would, you would hit maximum memory bandwidth, which is good, but you're doing a lot of redundant reads, meaning well, what happens with, with the red block further down this chain, he also needs a lot of the same neighbors that this red block does. So how can we maximize or reduce, maximize the memory bandwidth but reduce the redundant reads? And the way we did this for, for the FWI example is we iterate over 2D slices. So there's a 2D slice here, let's call it the XY plane, we'll call Z going up and down in purple here and, and XY uh, in, in the green plane here. Um, what ends up happening is you would store the green values in local memory. Now local memory is shared between other work items. And the work items uh, also in your work group can see this local memory as well. Which means that you don't need to read them more than once. You read them once and then you can share them with your neighbors. So that reduces the number of redundant reads. So that's what the, it's saying here, work group caches 2D planes in local memory. The work items themselves are going to store in registers or private memory 
the, the purple data here. And then you're going to iterate over these slices. And how you do that is you knock off the oldest one and then load the new one. So you always have all of the information stored in registers, again, very fast memory. And all you have to do is basically pop off the last one and then load in the next one. So you don't have to do a lot of redundant reads, again, which improves the performance substantially. Two other minor optimizations that we did in this, uh, in this uh, project was something called uh, kernel fusion. And what we did there was we had several kernels uh, being called. Uh, they were operating on the same volume. We were able to fuse them together in one larger kernel. And that reduced uh, the redundant global memory reads. What ended up happening was the compiler was able to determine that some of the data could be stored in registers, and that register could be reused for a later part, what used to be a separate kernel. So in a separate kernel, that would require a separate global memory read. But because it was in the, in the same kernel, the, the compiler was smart enough to keep the register around. And that reduced um, the global memory reads. And finally, I guess we call this kernel fission. <coughs> Excuse me. And what we're trying to do is to improve the, uh, the occupancy by, by lowering the resource requirements. And, and what this really means in practice was, were we able to, to simplify the kernels um, so that we used fewer registers? When you, your kernel uses fewer registers, it means that more wave fronts or work groups, work items can be put onto the GPU or, or scheduled to be run on the GPU. That uh, has the added benefit of masking the global memory latency. So when you go to that global memory, there's a time delay of latency. Ideally, you want the GPU to be doing something else, and, and improving the amount of, or the number of threads that can be run on the GPU is critical to that. By reducing the registers, that allows more threads to be active on the GPU, and thus hiding the, the memory latency. So it's a subtle point. It's, it's something that uh, as, you, as you program the GPU, you start to become more and more familiar with, but uh, it was something, again, that we, uh, we did there. So those were kind of the big four things that we did in terms of, in terms of performance. So. Now, in terms of the performance results, uh, you can see what we've uh, what we achieved here. Um, so, this was uh, with 15 hertz and and 15 shots. So, let's go down to this gray one here, sort of the, the starting baseline. So, if uh, if you had when we ran on the CPU that we were working on, 30 cores uh, per shot. So, one shot would be operated on by 30 cores. Took about 167,000 uh, seconds to to parse those 15 shots. Uh, interestingly, though, when you um, <coughs> and and this this one might not make sense the way it's written here, but I'll explain it. It says five cores per shot. What that actually meant was five cores were run per shot, but six shots were run in parallel. Again, so thirty cores were in use. So it says five cores per shot, which obviously should should run slower. But when you're running five cores per shot over six shots, the aggregate per shot was 67,000. So you actually processed uh, uh, six shots um, on a per shot basis. It was, it was actually slightly faster than running one shot over 30 cores. Good news, when you run it on the GPU using the, the optimized version that we had, we got it down to about 8,000 seconds, which was excellent. Um, multiplier of about 8.4 times over the, uh, <clears throat> the multi-shot CPU approach and 21x over the single shot uh, uh, approach on the CPU. The AMD GPU model we were using was a, a Radeon 7970, and that actually has six gigabytes uh, on it. So, all in all, the project was a success. Um, good performance results. Um, uh, James here at uh, Geotomo said some some uh, some nice things, and um, and it, it was a great uh, uh, a great project all in all. So, uh, and showed good performance. So, and I, 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 my understanding is they're quite uh, happy with the results. So I'll, I'll take questions at this point, uh, just to kind of uh, close off on the, on the formal part of the webinar. We do have some, some OpenCL uh, courses coming up uh, um, in Calgary. You can, you can uh, visit our website to find a little bit more information about that. Feel free to email me as well. Uh, we also do private on-site uh, classes. And again, if you're interested in consulting like this project, we also do that as well. Again, anything from, you know, is this possible through, through, full, uh, through full porting and, and commercialization as well. So. Again, thanks very much for, for attending, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing some of your questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Chris. Now we're going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation, as Chris mentioned. 
And as a reminder to everyone, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. So Chris, I'll get started with our first question. This is from Brian Park. And the question is, did your customer consider using other uh, products besides the AMD GPU? Um, the AMG, AMD GPU, and thanks for the question, the AMD GPU was a, was a, um, uh, yes, actually they did. They did consider all sorts of different uh, different types of uh, hardware. Ultimately, that was kind of decided because um, uh, some of their clients or key clients had uh, large infrastructure of AMD GPUs already in place um, to begin with. So it was a natural fit um, for a customer who was interested in in uh, in, in performing uh, performing the computations on on the G on on the AMD GPU. Obviously, they had the hardware and and things like that. I believe um, internally they also have, like I say, some clusters and things like that, but they already have a solution on that. They, again, they just wanted to, to speed it up and uh, um, available hardware that's sitting idle, that perfect, uh, perfect target platform. So, okay, next thank question. You. All right, thank yeah. you, Chris. Uh, the next question is from Virana. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And the question is, do you have any performance numbers for global memory access? Sure. I'll scroll back in my slides. Hopefully, we can still uh, still see them, um, and and I'll make a a little bit of a of a guess about uh, about that here. So I'm back to this memory bandwidth slide, and um, you you can see that like when people are citing multipliers for the GPU, a lot of times this is where this number is coming from. So performance numbers for global memory, you're typically looking at at the hundreds of gigabytes per second is 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 the the data throughputs. Um, they're obviously published, available. You won't quite see those numbers in practice. Um, you'll get a, uh, some percentage of them. Maybe it's 80%, uh, 70 80%. One thing that you can do as a, as a developer to see what the maximum is, is a lot of the, the examples that are provided um, by AMD, there's some, some memory uh, uh, throughput uh, ones as well. How You can run that on your target system, see what the throughput is, and then that can be uh, what uh, a, a better, a slightly better target goal. In our case, for this particular example, um, I'm not actually sure where we ended up, but uh, but it would be like uh, it, it would probably have been over 60 or 70 percent of, of the memory bandwidth. This is probably the numbers that we would have uh, obtained. The only other thing to kind of highlight is the latency is quite high on them. It's on the order of hundreds of cycles, uh, hundreds of clock cycles. Um, to get an element from global memory into the GPU. So again, that sort of came back to what I was talking about in the, in, uh, the, uh, the occupancy uh, kernel fission thing that we were doing there, where ideally you want to have the GPU doing as much as possible to hide those 300 cycles and also saturate the memory bus as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. Our next question is you went through four optimizations. Which one yielded the best performance gain? Sure, sure. Um, all right, so just kind of scrolling down to those. So the one of the this one that's it's on to here coalescing. So that that that's an easy answer. Um, it, it's super critical at, when you're programming the GPU to make sure that that your your memory is coalesced. Um, the profiler is going to help you out with that. It's going to let you know if you are, are coalesced, um, or, or give, at least give you an indication that if you are not uh, indexing um, and making sure that you're accessing continuous bursts and trying to get as much of a or the largest block possible, because you really do want to saturate that memory bus. Uh, once, <clears throat> probably let's say 60 percent, maybe 70 percent, uh, uh, kind of making that number up a little bit, but that would be kind of the ballpark of in terms of the percentage gain of optimizations, most of it is, is coming from here. Uh, the, the remaining 30% might be coming from other optimizations. So critical when you're writing your applications to, to focus on that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, our next question uh, is from Megharaj. I hope I'm saying that correctly. How actually is the OpenCL programming varies with different GPU vendors? 
Um, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously, like, you, you can talk about all sorts of different devices, too. I mean, it's not just even limited to vendors. And, yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I'll spend a little bit of time answering this one. It, even within a vendor, even within AMD GPUs, the programming can be a little bit different. Um, and I can share some stories here from, from our experiences in the past. So, um, even within <clears throat> the AMG, AMD GPU product line, AMD is constantly uh, revising its hardware, making it better, changing the architectures um, slightly. And you'll find that your algorithms, although they'll run, <clears throat> won't necessarily run optimally um, within an AMD uh, uh, product, uh, product line uh, from old to new hardware. And this isn't a bad thing. This is, this is just the nature of, of evolution. So what we do is we take a look at that. And we say, okay, well, we've got <clears throat> version one and version two of the hardware. We obviously start with the kernel that's working in version one. But now, how can we use some of the new excellent features in version two to make the to make the um, algorithm go faster? So, in that case, the the difference it might be, you know, it could be a couple lines. It, it could be even it could be even more complicated than that if you're switching um, from say like a. a, a, a a local data share to uh, more a caching based approach. So uh, there's a lot of um, kind of experimentation that, that goes along with it. Um, so yeah, OpenCL isn't necessarily created equal, but the nice thing about it is is that it does run, um, it, it will run as is out of, the, out of the box, but you definitely have to spend some time tuning it. And obviously the, if, you, if you were looking at something like an FPGA, for example, you're going to need to do a, a, a little bit more work than just say within from GPU to GPU because obviously different hardware and things like that. So, so good question. Thank you. Okay, our next question is from Brian Park, and the question is: Is this single precision workload intensive, or does this require double precision math? Yeah, it's uh, it's single precision, um, it, which is it's fortunate that uh, that the math allows that. Um, obviously, not all, all algorithms are. Are, um, are conducive to, to single precision only. Obviously, if you're doing any kind of linear algebra, you probably want to be in double precision. Um, the GPUs are still obviously best suited to single precision computations, just higher throughput, obviously less data, less memory. Um, <clears throat> so it, it is interesting, just as a programmer, pre-GPU, you're, you're, you're programming all of your, your CPUs with double and not even thinking about it. And now you have to kind of go back and say, will the math actually support single now? Because that could give me actually a, a quite substantial performance improvement. So, um, yeah, that, that part's, I, I guess I don't want to say it's a little bit frustrating. It's sort of the nature of, of, of where, we, where we are as, as scientists and engineers to have to kind of take a look back. But at the same time, we want performance. So, you know, we try to minimize, um, to minimize that. Although the CPUs in a lot of cases did show that as well anyway, because they have the same... Uh, same constraints on their memory buses too. So, yeah. So, so single precision was sufficient for this uh, for this project. Thank you. Okay. And our next question is from Tori Zook. Again, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. The question is, what would be the potential difference between a CUDA implementation and your OpenCL one? Okay, that's an interesting question too. Um, not a lot, I would say. In the end, they would they would have similar. Um, uh, both sets of hardware are, are are great, great for the GPU community. Um, the the OpenCL implementation for AMD is 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 good. The CUDA implementation from NVIDIA is good. Um, so in terms, and I'm sorry, I say good in terms of accessing the resources that are available to you on the GPU. So then, what you kind of get down to is, okay, let's say we were to, to migrate it to the uh, to, to CUDA, like out of OpenCL, I would expect on a comparable device with a comparable memory bandwidth, I would expect very similar uh, uh, performance numbers uh, coming out of both of those. Thank you. Okay, and our next question is from Jean-Pierre. And the question is, can you talk about how the size of device memory affects the performance of the algorithm? What would be the benefit of having, say, twice as much device memory? We like more memory. Um, as uh, More memory is better, um, always. So uh, 
what it, what you could do in that case is if you did have more device memory. Sorry, let me take a step back uh, just a little bit, and we'll, we'll how about we talk about like really small ones just to begin, and then we'll move into really big ones. So, so we'll look at the spectrum. So let's say you're actually using your GPU device, and and your algorithm actually isn't memory intensive for for whatever reason. You're operating on tens of of, of megabytes. Let's say that's not well suited to the GPU. This is where it's probably CPU um, CPU um, um, it's better to run on the CPU, and part of the reason is you're not going to saturate the memory bus. So um, you actually do want a sufficient level of data. So what uh, gets me interested uh, on a potential project is when people are saying, yeah, my, my data is on the order of gigabytes or, or even terabytes, because again, we can, we can do tricks to address those large uh, sets of data. More data simply means, uh, or sorry, more memory simply means more throughput. Uh, you can either increase the uh, amount of data in uh, in a given shot, not quite sure how how they do that. But even if you didn't do that, you could in theory fit uh, multiple shots on a GPU as well, which would um, although you'd still probably be saturating the memory bus, but being able to get more data again reduces the amount of transfers over the PCI Express bus as well. So only good things tend to happen with uh, with more memory. <clears throat> I guess I say only good things because I'm assuming the hardware designers might say things like power and all sorts of fun things there. But as a programmer definitely more memory is, uh, is, is always desirable. Um, in terms of raw performance gains, not sure if I could make an estimate on the number. That's one of those things that I'd have to try and, uh, and play around with and see what we could do for uh, performance. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right, and we have another question. Uh, you had mentioned a hardware driver issue that needed to be resolved earlier in the presentation. Can you talk about specifically what happened with that? Yeah, that's right. Um, so the hardware driver issue, uh, what ended up happening there was when we were working with the, the six gigabyte uh, GPU cards, initially we weren't able to actually see all of the six gigabytes. We'd, we could only get up to, I can't remember if it was three or four, but at some point I think what ended up happening was the 64-bit uh, the addressing ended up um, uh, uh, being broken for the driver we were working with. Um, one of the great things about uh, but working with uh, working with the hardware vendors like AMD directly, is you get to you get to send in um, uh, bug fixes and, and all sorts of stuff. So we just reproduced the problem. Um, AMD had a really quick turnaround for us on that. Had a new driver out, fixed the uh, fixed the addressing issue, and then we were able to see all uh, all six gigabytes, uh, which was great. And and part of the reason we didn't see this at the outset of the project, normally we try to uncover these kind of things in the feasibility, is that um, uh, initially we started with just three gigabyte cards. But then, uh, then uh, Geotomo decided they wanted to move to six again, more memory, all that good stuff. So that's uh, that's we saw it mid uh, mid project um, was addressed relatively quickly, and uh, hats off to the to the AMD driver team for being responsive about that. Okay, thank you, Chris. I think <coughs> we have time for uh, one or two more questions. We have another question. This one's from Shelton Ma. And the question is, how many stencils are to be arranged in one work group? Do those stencils need to be fitted into the shared memory? Yeah, I'm going to jump back to that. Uh, how many stencils? So, so yeah, no, I'm just trying to think what we actually launched. Them. I'm actually, I don't remember that detail um, off the top of my head, unfortunately. I'm just trying to see if I can come up with a number. Uh, one work group. My guess is... Uh, it's going to be like it's going to be multiple 64. Um, that number, yeah, is going to be, and it's also going to be tweaked based upon the occupancy. Sorry, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to trying to reach out in my mind here. Could be 256, could be 512, but it's, I'm sorry, Sean, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I don't have that detail uh, in my mind right now. My apologies. Okay, let's see. We've got another question coming in here. Uh, this one's from Brian Park. Would something like this benefit from HSA? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, mm, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, sorry, I'm just I'm just uh, thinking about that a little bit. I'm not I'm not sure. Like. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure off the top of my head there on that one either. I, 
I guess I'm hesitating there a bit um, in the sense that, um, again, given what the customer was, was asking and things like that, um, we never really considered that as, as an option. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure off the top of my head there. Okay. okay. Let's see. We've got one more. Uh, this one, how do I get started with OpenCL? Yeah, sure. Um, one thing you can do to get uh, to get started on uh, on OpenCL is um, head to the AMD uh, uh, website, uh, uh, look up uh, the the app SDK app SDK uh, in in Google. That'll get you right there, and um, and they have some excellent uh, uh, excellent getting started guides. Um, so that that's sort of the the first sort of uh, tactical way that that you would get started. In terms of um, how do I actually apply that to my um, how do I actually okay so great so I've downloaded all the drivers downloaded the, the compilers how do I actually work with my algorithm and, and it, to some extent I would say just kind of dive dive in so I mean run an example from AMD make sure it's working make sure that the, the SDK is installed properly once that's the case take, take your algorithm and um, make a simplified version of it so don't worry about all the all the features uh, break it down into some, the base, the base algorithm. Uh, plug that into your um, into your uh, into 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 a kernel. Try to write uh, obviously the minimum kernel possible. Get used to the concept of uh, of, of work items and work groups and and uh, um, local memory and, and private memory. Um, see if you can maximize the memory bandwidth, and then make sure the results are correct, of course, too. Once you kind of get there, then you can start adding in the the features that make your software. Uh, unique and competitive and all that good stuff um, and start and you can start to see how that impacts performance so it is kind of one of those things that uh, that you kind of kind of dive into a um, bit of shameless self-promotion obviously you can take a course with us uh, as well we like to uh, uh, our, our courses again are hands-on so it gives you a nice uh, way to ease into the ease into the programming as well so um, but but uh, also lots of uh, stuff available on online as well so so quite a few options but that's how uh, how you can kind of dive in and, uh, and get going. Okay, thank you. Well, that is all of our time for right now. And again, thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, uh, Accelerating Full Waveform Inversion via OpenCL on AMD GPUs. If you have any other questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, you can contact Chris at the email on your screen. That's chris.mason at accelerware.com. On behalf of AMD and Chris Mason, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your afternoon.